We did the 1AT. Now it's the VR. Yeah, we got requested for it. We hadn't really planned on doing this video, but we just released the 1AT one a few days ago. Who knows when you'll see this one, but we wanted to do one on the VR. And this one's gonna kind of cover the, I guess sort of the same deal, like the best uh, VR6 build. Now, there's 12L VRs, there's even five cylinder VRs. There's a 24 valve and the 3.2 and the 3.6. We haven't boosted a VR5 ever because we never got them here in North America. I do have a customer that is bringing one in that is talking to me about boosting it. So that may happen. Uh, we've done 24 valves, 12 valves, and 3.2s plenty of times. I've yet to boost a 3.6, but Clayton and I, we have one stashed away that I do plan on boosting at some point. Yeah, if you remember knows. the video with the Torig and the, the Torig. Yeah, the Torig used to <laughs> tow our trailer. We'll, we'll link that up above, that, that, that car's dead. <laughs> that Torig now, the engine is sitting aside for us. Um, but on that note, how does the VR stack up and what you need to do for building these things? A couple of things to really uh, take note on is obviously it's a larger displacement engine. And because of that, it requires less boost to make horsepower. And because it requires less boost, it's a little bit easier on parts. There are, guys have made a lot of power with this thing, these things in stock form. However, on pump gas, the key to this living is typically a head spacer. So on most engine builds for the kind of 400 wheel horsepower, and depending on the 24 valve and 3.2, up to 500 wheel horsepower, basically a head spacer is going to do the trick. And yeah, that's the lower of the compression because these were never boosted. Exactly, and the major problem with them and trying to boost them without doing a head spacer or even doing a head spacer and getting aggressive, trying to run too much boost on crappy fuel, these pistons are trash. The 1AT pistons go a really long way. The VR pistons, although this one looks pretty good, if you look really fine, a little close up, Clayton, you'll see a couple little cracks there. I'll try to keep this from moving too far so you can keep it in focus. And this crack is actually the entire ringland broke out of the piston. So as you can see, <laughs> I could flick that right out of there. The rings are the only thing holding it in. Um, and that's why this one's here actually is because previous builder, tuner, whatever, didn't do the required things to keep this thing alive and broke a ringland. And let me tell you, this is common. This is a common practice. If it can't really take much knock at all, it's, it's the point of failure in this. So proper tune, not, don't try to run it on 87 octane, head spacer motor, will go really far. The connecting rods will go really, really far. So if you're trying to make, you know, over 500 wheel horsepower, it's kind of recommended. And again, guys have pushed these further for sure, but for the regular build, a set of forged pistons are gonna go a long way. Um, typically on a build that we're gonna try to make even five to 600 wheel horsepower in, we'll do a set of pistons and we'll still use stock connecting rods. And to give you guys a, a, a comparison, the 1AT rods, as we say, lots are trash. Here's a 1.8 turbo rod in comparison to a VR rod. So the VR rod can take a lot more, of a, a lot more abuse. Pretty sure I've seen plenty of guys making like excessive thousand wheel horsepower with stock connecting rods. That's not for everybody, but kind of as we said in those tiers, Kind of the 400 wheel horsepower range, definitely do a head spacer at the minimal. If you got a little bit of money, obviously a set of forged pistons are gonna go a long way, but for the average build on a VR, whether it's a 12 valve, 3.2, 24 valve, whatever, um, a head spacer is gonna go really far. So one thing to talk about the connecting rods, they are very strong. However, the rod bolts are not that strong. So typically guys that are upgrading um, trying to push for power, like again, beyond what you would typically see out of a head spacer motor. Guys will upgrade the rod bolts in this. That's actually what's gonna happen with this engine. We're upgrading the rod bolts. Now there's gonna be endless debate on the interwebs about if you should have these bored out or line bored to match. 
You 100% should. We've had success not doing it, but rule of thumb, when you're replacing the bolts with ARP bolts, these should be line bored so that they're in spec. The reason, the reason you would have to do that is because when you put ARP bolts on it, it basically will distort this and it won't be circular anymore. Clamping force? It's right? got to do with yeah. how they're clamped down, yes. So this specific engine setup, we're doing a set of rod bolts in it. They will be line bored, the rods will be line bored so that they're fully within spec. Once you get above, say that five, 600 wheel horsepower range, it kind of snowballs much like the 1AT stuff. You have to, oh, actually Clayton, you had brought up doing the head spacer, a couple of things. Every time we do a head spacer motor in a VR, we always do a set of ARP head bolts, head studs, um, not bolts, head studs. And usually we'll take a look at the timing setup. Obviously, if you got this thing apart to do a head spacer, you want to make sure that the timing's all in check, the guides aren't all beat out of it, anything like that. Clayton, you look like you're going to say something. It's not fun doing that after the fact, so do, do it well to prayer. Yeah, so this is one of those cases. Obviously, the timing belt and everything on a 180s is easily accessible. On these, if you got it out and it's on the stand, you want to make sure that the timing kit is good. Uh, speaking of the breaking, the ring lens and the piston, and them you know, being very susceptible to knock. What also happens, Clayton, you'll know, probably have to show over here. Mm -hmm. You can see that the sidewalls get beat out of it oh, as yeah. everything starts scratching on it. Usually that happens when it's knocking its face off. Um, and then when the ring lamp breaks, it can cause even more damage than that. In some cases they'll just stay put, but sometimes they'll come out and gouge into the cylinder walls. So this one's being bored out. We're not talking about this specific engine, but we wanted to um, kind of give guys an idea of like what kind of horsepower you can get out of what setup. So we left off kind of 600 plus wheel horsepower range. Obviously you get into doing cams, you can do larger valves. Once you get over the average setup, you know, parts list starts to add up pretty extensively. That doesn't really matter if it's a 12 valve, 24 valve, whatever it may be. Exactly. Be. I'm not getting specific into each one of those because they're all, they all are kind of the same once you get over a certain level. What I will say is the 12 valve, 24 valve versus 3.2, or like all of those kind of versus each other. The 3.2, 24 valve is going to make the most power easiest. So if you're looking to start with a VR, those ones will make the most power easiest. So low boost, we see typically 400 wheel horsepower on a right turbo setup at like 12, 13 pounds of boost typically. On a 12 valve with the crappier flowing head, um, they take more boost to do it, but still low in comparison. So the 12 valve will make like usually around 17, 18 pounds to make around 400 wheel horsepower on pump gas. Keep in mind, I'm, I am referring to pump gas here. The one thing that is different is that you'll know of a 180 at 17, 18 pounds of boost on a, on a turbo that's good for the street use or even moderate track use isn't making that kind of power at that low of boost. So that's the big difference why these can take power a little bit easier. Obviously they're very strong, they're very well built, there's lots of head studs, all that sort of thing. But the displacement kind of wins being able to make more horsepower easier. So it's typically a little bit easier on parts. Uh, some other things to think about when building VRs, the back cylinders, because of the way these are designed, all the air flows basically in between hot cylinders. So the back three cylinders Number one typically is a little bit better, um, but the back three cylinders typically are seeing a lot more heat. So when it comes to tuning, if you're doing it with standalone or something like that, usually you really want to keep an eye on the back cylinders. And this is in relation to any of the VRs. They just tend to get a little bit hotter, so you can tune appropriately, add a little bit more fuel to these. Typical, you know, OEM, ECU tuning capabilities like with United or wherever they have most of these things dialed in. In fact, United Motorsports when it comes to stock ECU is probably the king of the king of the castle when it comes to uh, tuning VRs, boosted VRs on stock ECU. 
I'm probably done talking now. So we won't babble on too much more about this. The, obviously with any engine, the sky's the limit. You can do endless things to it. For the typical street build, a head spacer is more than enough. You start creeping up, you wanna use really trashy fuel or you wanna push the boost really high, do a set of pistons, upgrade the raw bolts. In regards to the cranks, typically the 12 volt cranks are really good. The only crank that I think I've seen, I haven't experienced it yet, but it looks like the Mark V R32 crank was a cast crank and I think guys have had issues with them. I specifically haven't. And actually that's a question to the internet. Have you seen a Mark V R32 or A3 cast crank fail? And if you have in regards to boost, what kind of power level have you seen them fail at? There's a lot of talk on the internet about them failing. I just haven't seen them in person. So not that we have tons of Mark V R32s around here that we've boosted, but all the ones that we've pushed have all been forge cranked engines. So I never have to really worry about them. Um, Clayton, am I forgetting anything about this? You had named a couple things. Yeah, I was just saying like the mains. And we could talk about this forever because like you said, the sky's the limit. The sky's the limit. Yeah. So but for the average setup, guys have pushed these engines very far on fairly stock components. Usually I think head spacer or really good fuel and upgraded rod bolts and guys are going real far with these. With that said, maybe we'll find out. We're going to, and maybe I'll just talk about it now. For all of those guys that have followed along the channel for a long time, we have the 1.8 Hoopty that we've done. We have sourced another engine, a VR6 12 valve, completely stock, that we plan on doing the same thing too. We're not gonna upgrade anything on it except for a turbo setup. So we're doing exhaust manifold, turbo, uh, sorry, intake manifold, and a large turbo on standalone with really good fuel. And we plan on just sending that thing as far as it can go. And we'll probably end up cleaning up stuff on the dyno. <laughs> we didn't have to on the 1AT, but it might happen. So if you guys have any questions or comments about this or any of the other videos on our channel, um, ask the questions below. Hopefully you guys learned something from this. Don't forget to like and subscribe. We'll see you in the next video. Um, what else? Pause. Orange silicone. Make sure you put orange silicone in everything. This specific <laughs> engine is, yes, covered in full orange silicone. <laughs>